We live in an interactive world where new social media challenges pop up all the time. Some for enjoyment, some for a good cause, others are just plain dangerous. What if you tried a new challenge? One that could transform your life, community, and the world. What if you spent 40 days studying Jesus' words and applying his teachings to everyday life? All focused on five principles. Being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going like Christ. So what are you waiting for? Let's join together and take the Red Letter Challenge. It's not coming soon, it is here. Here we are, we're into the third week of the good le- uh, the Red Letter Challenge. <clears throat> and you might have woke up this morning thinking, wow, what an amazing convergence of of events. Mother's Day. It happens to be Good Shepherd uh, Sunday as well. And we're doing the forgiveness in the Red Letter Challenge. No? Nobody woke up thinking that? Okay. Well, all right. I didn't either, to be honest. (laughs) But we've got all these things playing together, and all of them make us think about forgiveness. You know, we have Mother's Day, and as I had mentioned earlier, In most of our lives, our mothers have been kind and gentle and loving to us, sometimes disciplining us, but always forgiving. And then we have Good Shepherd Sunday. And how can we ever get past the thought of the Good Shepherd and what he has done for us to save us from ourselves? To wash away all the sins of our lives so that we can be free with him. And of course now we have our red letter challenge where we're going to talk about forgiveness today. So interestingly enough, um, there was a pastor's pastoral conference this week. And Pastor Wisher, who is our district president, gave a message about... Good Shepherd Sunday. And his message was all the imagery behind Christ as the Good Shepherd and um, how we are his flock. We are the sheep. And he presented three premises which really fit in well to our reading today. Three premises of how we are like sheep. Now his first one was... We're herd animals, just like sheep. We're followers, whether we want to admit it or not. We're always following someone or something, whether good or bad. It's just the way we are. We see it um, everywhere, all around us in our lives. His second premise was that um, sheep aren't very smart. Now, I think sheep get kind of a a bum rap because I don't think they're quite as dumb as we think they are, but they're not the brightest animal in the farmyard. But you know what? Sometimes we're not either. Sometimes we do some incredibly foolish things, make incredibly foolish decisions, and we are like sheep in that that regard. His last, last premise was, We are vulnerable, just like sheep. I'm sure none of you have gone out and tried to wrestle sheep. They have no way of protecting themselves. They can't really bite you. They have no claws. They're just a little puffball. There's nothing they can do to protect themselves from predators. And you know what? We're like that too, aren't we? The ultimate predator out there, Satan, is someone that we are not able to defend ourselves against. So as I said, this really fits well with our reading today from the Holy Gospel. Because if we start out in verses um, 3 to 5, here's what we read. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to Jesus a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act, in the version that I'm reading, 
Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such people should be stoned. But what do you say? Now, it's obvious here that the Pharisees and the scribes are acting like a herd, aren't they? Someone got this thing moving, and they all just joined in. What they failed to think about was they're quoting or trying to quote Moses' law about stoning this poor woman, when in fact the law in Leviticus and Deuteronomy is pretty clear, and it says that you bring both parties to be stoned to death. They only brought the woman. It's almost like it was a planned event. Like, we're just going to rush him. We're going to bum rush him. We're going to make him stumble. We're going to make him say something that's going to derail his ministry. But that doesn't happen, does it? So that's the herd mentality that we see in our reading. But what about the bad decision? Well, the bad decision is kind of pointed out in verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Now this is where they decide, maybe we made a bad decision here. Maybe we got on board before we really thought this thing through. Because in fact, as I had said, they're not really following what the law says for starters. They probably singled out this poor woman for a number of reasons besides what they claim is occurring. But the interesting thing here is they realize their decision is bad. They drop the stones and walk away. Now, if you think about sheep, an interesting thing about sheep, when they're at water and drinking, they're kind of sloppy, like my daughter, St. Bernard. And they dribble water down the front of them, and their wool starts soaking up all this water. And they start to get heavier and heavier until finally they're not smart enough to stop. They'll fall into the water and actually drown. Okay, so maybe sheep are dumb. But, <laughs> but you know what? Don't we do that sometimes too? Don't we just start down a path? And even though we start to realize something's not quite right, we just keep going. We don't turn back. Now, fortunately for the sheep, there is a shepherd there who reaches out and pulls them back before they end up drowning. But for us, it's the good shepherd, Jesus. He reaches out and he puts a stop to what's happening if we're willing to be calm and listen to him. So what we see here is the Pharisees come to their senses because the good shepherd has reached out to them in a way that connects to them and they realize they are actually in the wrong here. And they need to change course. I think we do that a lot ourselves too, but sometimes we're really dumb and we just keep charging ahead. And I think... In my own, exa- uh, uh, my own experience, it's usually because either I did not pray on the subject first and get good counsel from Jesus, or I didn't take the time to go to a godly person to give me good counsel on that particular question or situation. I just charged ahead on my own. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, we all do that, don't we? But fortunately... Sometimes Jesus intervenes, and he pulls us back from the brink, just like that sloppy drinking sheep at the edge of the water. But you know, ultimately, our biggest problem and what gets us in the most trouble is our vulnerability. We have no defenses in and of ourselves against Satan. And he is going to constantly attack us every day, every hour. He knows us as well as God knows us. And he knows what buttons to push. Our ultimate defense, and really our only defense, 
is Jesus Christ. How many of you have ever gotten a situation and you realize something is at work behind the scenes here and said, away from me, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ? Anybody ever had that thought? Had that situation occur? Okay. Don't forget that because that is powerful. That will chase him away. That can save you. Keep that in mind. But what else do we know here? Well, a large part of our vulnerability happens to be the offenses that we carry in our hearts. Things that we have done to other people that we can't face. That we can't do anything with. We just kind of hang on to it. It's like this heavy yoke just bearing down on us constantly. We can't let it go. We can't move forward. That's our greatest vulnerability, our regrets. And a lot of times I think we overcompensate for that. And we do it in a kind of a strange way. We will look at what our offenses are, either to people or to God, and we'll think, ah, oh, that's kind of minimal. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't have much consequence. On the flip side of it, though, if somebody offends us, that's a monumental event. And we are going to hold on to that, aren't we? We're not going to let them get away with that. That, I think, is our biggest vulnerability. And when I talk about that, it reminds me of a conversation I had with my Uncle Paul about a year ago. He married into the family on my mother's side. My mother's family was deep Irish roots. So he was telling me all about how he had met my aunt and, you know, some of the challenges they had early on in their life, in their marriage. And he asked me if I knew about the Irish disease. No idea what he was talking about. He says, you know, the Irish have this disease, and as they get older, they forget all kinds of things, but they never forget a a grudge. And you think about that, aren't we all like that? Don't we tend to be like that? We'll just hold on to anything. I don't think you have to be Irish, because I'm pretty sure my good German roots do the same thing, or any other roots that we have out there. There are people who just cannot let go. So what do we do about that? How can we really get rid of that yoke we're carrying and move past it? Well, he gives us a a remedy here in our reading. If we go and look at verses 10 and 11, we read, When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How simple is that? Maybe not so easy. To execute, but how simple is that? Change your life. Don't sin anymore. Move on. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is where our biggest disconnect is, our biggest vulnerability. Because corporately here, we all know Jesus went to the cross. He died on the cross so that we are forgiven. Do we take it personally? Do we really understand that personally Jesus Christ saved each and every one of us? I wonder sometimes. And I wonder if that's not why we're carrying this yoke that we carry about sometimes. We are so wrapped up with that yoke that we can't even forgive ourselves let alone forgive someone else, or accept that Jesus actually died for us. We just look at it as a corporate event. 
not a personal event. I can tell you a number of years ago, I got trapped in a situation that was foolishness on my part. But the outcome of it was that not only did I carry a grudge, I didn't carry just a grudge against the people involved. I carried a grudge against anyone who even looked like them. If they were in that same business setting and they looked like these people, I would not engage them. I could not do it. That's how upset I was about the whole situation. That's how heavy that grudge, that burden, that yoke was carrying me, that I was carrying. Matter of fact, I couldn't even pray for myself. That's how bad I felt about the whole situation. And then one day, Jesus grabbed me. I think he threw me on the ground and stomped on me a couple times, kind of shaked me around a little bit. He said, wait a minute, wake up here, wake up here. And I finally realized, yes, he was telling me, I have forgiven you. Now it's time for you to forgive yourself so that you can forgive others. Seems like a simple formula, huh? Can we follow it? I hope we can. And I'm going to plead with you right now to take that step, to actually forgive yourself for whatever burdens you're carrying because it makes no sense for you to carry them. Christ did die for you. He did go to the cross for you. To him, it doesn't exist anymore. Why should it for you? And you know what you're going to gain from that? A lot of peace. A lot of peace in your life. You will not be constantly having that burden overshadow you, weigh you down, and pull you back from doing the things that God really wants you to do. So forgive yourself. And amazingly, you're going to find out how easy it is to forgive others, to give up that disease, whatever ethnicity you are, not to hold the grudge, and to move on and be what God created you to be. I ask you to do that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.